take a moment and appreciate the leadership of the Reverend Renwa Hamami, the Executive Director of the Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry of California. I really enjoyed our Time for All Ages today. I enjoyed sitting on the steps with the kids who knew immediately, by the way, in case you couldn't hear the commentary that it was kid president, and they had their own comments about that to me. When I was a kid, I didn't have kid president. I didn't even know who Martin Luther King was. I knew about recycling centers where you could bring your own bottles and smash them against these little concrete stalls. It was a great way to release things that needed to be released like the tension in my own home. When I was what we would now call a preteen, I guess then we just called it a big kid, <laughs> I understood that we had tensions in my home for many reasons, but one was that my mother was white and my dad was, well, what my classmates called Jap or chink, which was totally not accurate at all. I was raised outside of religion. I didn't have God. I didn't have any big heroic figures. Being a Jap got me pinched and kicked and cursed on the school bus for many, many years. Being in between things, not fitting in, being an outcast was part of my elementary school and middle school days. In high school, my natural love of people kicked in and overrode that, and I had friends, and I did well in school. But some of my friends' parents would not allow me to sleep over. And when we got all into that dating game, some of the boys that I liked who liked me had parents who would not let us go out together. By the time I was a teen, going through all that wonderment of those years, my father had encountered the, the racist glass ceiling of academia, and his addiction, which he'd had since his college days, was getting worse and worse and worse. Because he was a scientist, we didn't have, as I said, religion or community. Because he was Japanese and racist in his own right, we didn't have connection to the civil rights struggle that was all around us in those days. It wasn't until I was in college in the southeast of the US that I learned about, about the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And when I heard his message and his vision, it was a beautiful note for me. This um, morning, in between services, we celebrated the births of those most chronologically gifted among us, <laughs> Bill Steenberg and Vic Bogart, and you know, Dr. King would have been eligible to sit behind the cake today because it's this month that had he lived, he would have turned 90. And how would he assess where we are now? What would he be feeling in his heart if he were among us? This time, so far from his death, when laws have changed, but we know now that hearts, many hearts have not. I don't actually think that he would be that surprised. He might be disappointed, but perhaps not surprised at the uproar we're still in about race, an uproar that rose to a fever pitch during the 2016 election, when what some of us know through our daily experience was revealed to more of us, that racism in many forms is still very alive among us. Stanford University's Francis Fukuyama is one of the most influential authors of the neoconservative movement. And he is the one who popularized the term identity politics. It is a phrase that was eagerly embraced by the religious right to talk about what they call the overemphasis on identity in our political and shared life, the unfair privileging of a racial or ethnic minority at the cost of the white majority. It is, let's be very clear, a term of disdain, a term of discounting, 
a term that says there is no validity in today's world in using the frame of race. Since the 2016 election, two things have happened. One is that many people of color, when forced to see the extent to which racism that they had known there as kind of a ghosting or a shadow boxing was still alive, began to be more adamant about naming what they saw. And the other thing was that the religious left started asking whether perhaps we were too engaged in identity politics. We took up that term among us, a term which Fukuyama says is defined as pandering to voters through demographics. And he also calls it the politics of resentment. Now ours is a religion which calls on us to engage in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. So I'm gonna go through some facts here and ask us to think about this, whether conversations using the lens of race are realistic or whether they're just intentionally divisive. Are they just distractions from the real issues before us or are they based on something true among us? Is identity politics what is tearing us apart? Or is it that foundational racism that's still among us in our country? And what would Dr. King think? What would he say? What are the facts? Despite how much I loved Kid President, I will say that I think that that representation is one of the sentimentality kind of ways we look at, sentimental ways we look at Dr. King, because he did not actually preach a message of easy love. And as his life progressed, his message got more and more and more radicalized. By the time of his death, still as a young man, he was clear about the connections between racism, economic inequality, and the rise of militarism in our response to other nations. And so today, let's look at those facts. First, economic inequality. It has grown since King's Day by every measure that you look at. In terms of income, most certainly. As UCAL Berkeley economist and former presidential advisor Robert Reich points out, he says that 80% of us live paycheck to paycheck. And the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities says that the income gap has gr actually grown since the 1970s, and the wealth gap has grown even more. And Reich points out that that is even more dangerous, because the concentration of income and wealth at the very top of the distribution has now rose to levels only seen 90 years ago during what we call now the Roaring Twenties. The center data shows that real income for those in the top 5% has actually increased 180% in real dollars. But for anyone at the median or below, the median income remains flat. In other words, the top 5% has seen their income grow in relation to expenses, but more than half our nation is still actually living at 1973 levels. So let's look at militarization, number two. One of the most grim facts about our world today is the extent to which the militarization we were concerned about against other nations remains. But what is also true is that we have brought it into our communities. We lifted up Mary Fenelon today, and I remember being with her when we were at a meeting, and we, Walnut Creek's affordable housing advocates, were shocked to learn that our city has a tank and very high-powered weaponry stored in our armory. This is something that's been happening across our nation because it allows us to, in times when fewer of these, these um, instruments of war are used, to keep providing contracts to military contractors to use more as we donate them for free to municipalities. Third, the environment. The Reverend Dr. William Barber, who designed the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina and most recently became one of the leaders of taking up King's last campaign, the Poor People's Campaign, has now added a fourth threat to the agenda Dr. King was working on at the time of his death. He now says it's racism, economic inequality, militarization, and the failure to address the realities of what we are doing to our precious environment. 
We know about rising sea levels and global temperatures, extinctions and degradation. And these are things at a level not even imaginable by those early environmental activists who were promoting recycling and such when I was a child and King was leading. So if we look at it, there is in fact growing economic inequality, a pernicious and spreading militarism within our borders and against them, a clock ticking on our role with the environment. So perhaps it is true that addressing our nation's perennial problem of race, the one that King gave his life for, is, is really now just a distraction. Maybe we should choose this set of issues and not look at that one. But the next fact is true, that all of these issues are affected by your race. You are less likely to have savings, wealth, or an income above $1973, depending on if you are of a group that we have marginalized in this country. You are more likely to be in our military as a way out of poverty or into education, and your likelihood to be a victim of the local militarization of our police forces is increased your likelihood to be affected by the current effects of our environmental degradation is already increased. It is affected by what race you are. And the data from the American Public Health Association shows this over and over again. Low income communities and communities of color are disproportionately affected by the health challenges of all that is happening around us. So yes, Dr. King, some of us among us would use race as a way to divert us away from these other issues that we need to pay attention to. And yes, identity remains an issue among our nation. We have yet to find a way to break that pattern that we have that Jelani Cook Cobb, a writer for The New Yorker, describes as an expanding concept of we, followed by a contracting, fearful idea of who we should be. And we do that over and over again. Do we need to address the bedrock racism which, which shapes our society, or do we need to look at the threats when people don't have what they need to live? And when we take that money and we put it towards more weapons and guns and walls, which, by the way, in addition to their effect on our human relations, will hurt our environment as well. I think that Dr. King would look at the facts in 2019 and say yes and yes. It has become the custom on this particular weekend once a year to bring out a few choice phrases from the Reverend Dr. King often the ones that have to do with justice and love, and they are wonderful words. Today for this service, we chose to focus on the letter from a Birmingham jail, a time when King was facing much criticism and threats as his nonviolent direct actions were seen as too confrontational and too damaging to the social order. He wrote that letter from a jail cell in 1963, and these are some of his words to his detractors. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a man of faith. In his last speech, he talked about the progress he had seen, progress which was mostly about forcing people into conversations because few things were actually, actually resolved while he was alive. For those among us who lived through those times, what is happening, what has happened since then can seem like enough for those who are inheriting the world behind us. But for those who are inheriting that world, it is a world with increased income inequality, 
increased militarization, and a world threatened as never before by climate change. I think that Dr. King would counsel us as people of goodwill and resources to believe and have faith in our own courage and commitments to come together to do the things we need to do to overcome these challenges. He would say to us, stay engaged and listen to our younger activists, the ones actually who no longer believe in heroic figures. They think that action comes from all of us working together. They would ask us to be present. On this Martin Luther King Day of service, we should heed the words of heir apparent William Barber, who said, we do not need a commemoration. We need a reconsecration. Tomorrow, some of us, I hope many of us, will be at the corner of Civic and Broadway doing the service of witness and reconsecration, coming to bring the message of Dr. King's true life story to many who are coming to take advantage of what has become just another shopping holiday. Let us come with signs that call for an end to racism, an end to income inequality, that calls out militarism, and that names our commitment to our precious earth. When I look at the facts in our nation, when I look at the hearts in our nation, hearts that are full of fear of the other, I believe that Dr. King would say that we both have a problem with race, which is why people of not goodwill can always summon the specter of shared power with people of color and cause a huge and enormous backlash. And he would say, we have issues that we need all of us to work on together. It's a both and. Our dialogue around race as a nation and as a community and as a church has been one dominated by pain because we cannot always hear one another's fears. We sometimes sin and fall short of that mark. They are not the same, and then the resentments fly. But it is not just identity politics, something anti-intellectual to be dismissed easily. It is, in fact, our ongoing commitment to address the tragic history of race among us. Yes, these issues can be used to shift the focus away from the issues that we must tend to most immediately. And yes, they can be encompassed into our understanding so that we truly live into that mutuality that Dr. King spoke of. You know, in a lot of UU services, we sing, we shall overcome at the end. It's kind of the feel-good way that we go out. But we didn't do that this year. We sang it at the beginning. Because that's the part of King's legacy where it's easy for us to start. But I believe the legacy calls us forward beyond that into this time. Dr. King realized the intensity and the venom that can spew when the Pandora's box that is this nation's legacy on race is opened. And he also knew that once it is opened, it cannot be shut. He knew this because of death threats and hate mail and the earlier attempts on his life. He knew that any attempt to address racism would require dismantling some of the very structures of our communities that we think we cannot give up. And he knew it would take a very fierce and a very imperfect kind of love. He knew that we would break our vows and miss the mark, which is what the word sin means in archery. He said, in the language of more than a half century ago, if I have said anything in this letter that overstates the truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. And if I have said anything that understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. 
May our dream be realized, and may we be part of making it so.